Good evening, and thanks for joining us today for our program on the Trayvon Generation with Dr. Elizabeth Alexander and Kevin Merida. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 26th season. Enormous thanks to Dr. Alexander and to Kevin Merida for returning to Writer's Block. I first became acquainted with Dr. Alexander's work when she read her great poem, Praise Song for the Day, at President Obama's first inauguration in 2009. It shook me then, and while I don't remember the words now, I can still remember the feelings that it aroused in me. Besides being a presidential poet, Dr. Alexander is a distinguished scholar and cultural critic. Her essay in The New Yorker during the summer of 2020 jolted me and readers around the world as it presented a perspective on Black young people relative to American culture and society, Black artistic and cultural expression, and stark urban truths. In her book, The Trayvon Generation, Dr. Alexander reflects on the reality that this generation of young Black people, the Trayvon generation, live in a vortex of violence that no matter how protected or privileged they might be, whether by economic or family or social circumstances, that violence touches them constantly. Dr. Alexander looks at the power of art as something that can teach and touch people from generation to generation about connecting and about healing. It's a terrific book and contains a gorgeous bunch of photographs and art. I'm holding this up now. Um, I urge you to visit our website and click on the link to SO1 Books to get a copy with a signed book plate. Email your questions to us at reservations at writersblockpresents.com. Kevin Mer Merida is the executive editor of the LA Times. He was managing editor at the Washington Post and helped score four Pulitzers under his watch. After his enormous success at the Post, Kevin ran news at ESPN with a special interest in race, sports, and culture. His newest challenge is already paying off at the LA Times. You'll have questions. Be sure to email them to us again at reservations at writersblockpresents.com. Thanks so much. And I want to welcome Kevin uh, Merida and Dr. Elizabeth Alexander. Andrea, Thank thanks so much for uh, having us, Writer's Block. This is fantastic. I get to connect with my friend Elizabeth. This is a, a pleasure, a treat for me that we'll see each other soon at the Pulitzer Board <laughs> meeting, yes. uh, judging great work. Um, but no, you, you know, first of all, I'm just going to thank you. You know, I want to, I want to publicly thank you for inspiring me. You know, I read your book. I was flying back from DC and I read it. And actually we all need some lift sometime. You need something that, that helps inspire you to keep, to drive forward. Um, and I think you, you have a powerful way language. You talk about language in the book and the power of it. And, and you, you willed it so beautifully and so, so carefully and so lovingly. And uh, it really, it meant a lot to me to read it. Well, now, thank you, yeah. beautiful words. I don't wanna get emotional you. here too early, but I, I felt myself getting emotional when I was reading it. Um, and I have sons like you do. Mm -hmm. And so it was very important. One in the Trayvon generation, our youngest. Um, but tell me about, um, the process of going from the New Yorker essay, which certainly got a lot of attention, to book form. And what were you thinking you wanted to do? Well, the New Yorker essay came out in June of 2020 when you know we all remember all that was going on. We had been locked down in pandemic, uh, in fear, in isolation seeing also the disproportionate toll that COVID-19 was taking on black and brown people, poor people. And with, you know, the case of George Floyd and that long, long horrific murder that we witnessed watching Darnella Frazier's film of it, you know, hearing his words, this just sparked people seeing it over and over and over again sparked people and sent people out into the streets to raise their voices. And the things that I had been thinking for a long time as someone raising sons, as someone looking at uh, all of the disproportionate racial violence that is needed against us, 
thinking about the anxiety and the fear. And as an educator, a, 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 a university educator for decades, you know, loving young folks, meeting them at a particular time in their lives and listening to the ways in which they were responding to the dehumanization and the persistence of race at a pro as a problem at the center of their lives and American life and listening to the culture, looking at the culture, listening for the culture, thinking about people like Kendrick Lamar and the ways in which, you know, he in his work, you know, there's a sorrow that suffuses so much of his work. You know, he's speaking from a very deep place within. He's making protest music that is trying to get to joy. I mean, I think of, you know, you know that anthem, uh, you know, we gonna be all right. And the way in which that is, a, you know, a song for the dance floor and a song for the streets, uh, and a song that comes out of a, a sorrow song to invoke Du Bois's words. You know, I think back. I'm always because I'm, a, a, you know, again a black a literature professor uh, for so long. I think back uh, to Frederick Douglass uh, when he said um, he was trying to. I read about this in the book. Go against the myth of happy black people singing. And he said, slaves sing most when they are most unhappy, but we transform and make song out of it. So all of that came together into this essay for the New Yorker. So to the next part of your question, uh, there was more to say afterwards because as an educator, I've always believed in close readings of, uh, of single things, bringing all of the meaning out of a poem, out of a historical moment, or example, out of a work of visual art. So I just kept going. Uh, I wrote about uh, a textbook that John Hope Franklin put together in the 1960s that was not an African-American history textbook, but an American history textbook that talked about multicultural experiences and how he was blacklisted and accused of instilling a guilt complex in white people by telling the complexity of our history. That certainly seems resonant today. Uh, I wrote about Zora Neale Hurston years before uh, writing to Dr. Du Bois and saying, I wish there were a cemetery for the illustrious Negro dead, mm -hmm. acknowledging that black people are often not remembered properly and that we have to do our own remembering. Writing about Stone Mountain in Georgia, the largest monument to the Confederacy in the world, the largest bas-relief sculpture in the world, and thinking about how white supremacy is still enshrined in our landscape. Writing about a visit I made to Angola prison. And you know that is a sorrow song, that chapter, that is just a bearing witness, yeah. talking about what I encountered and, and saw there in that place where 90% of the people who go in die there and has the largest percentage of lifers on planet earth and wanting to give an example of some art that was made out of um, the depths of that sorrowful experience so it kept growing and what seemed very important was the visual art as part of the conversation of the book and so um, i feel really happy that i was able to get it reproduced beautifully uh, so that there is uh, a learning from that uh, and an encountering, you know, with that, as well as the words themselves. Yeah, I want to get into some of those points you, you raised, but you mentioned the art, and I know the cover, Carrie Mae Weems, whom I met by accident because we were at a conference together, that mm. was a really wonderful conference in California that the CAA put on, and I ended up giving her a ride back to LA and we drove together and, and we and we along the way we talked and I learned and I thought this was just a beautiful gift to me to be able yes. to, to ride and, and drive Carrie Mae Weems to LA. You know, she from is a maybe queen. An hour. Yeah, and 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 I learned so much in that. And but I I wondered about the art. It's it's you know what what we probably would say in journalism are like interstitials, but mm -hmm. but it's really it you stop, you know, you're, so you're reading and you, and you stop along the way. I wonder what was the selection process for you with the art, the artists, in some case you reference them, you see the art and then you talk about it. So tell me your thought process in, in that selection. 
Yeah, well, I've been, um, you know, writing about living with uh, devoted to black art my whole life, literally from from my childhood. Um, and in my teaching, uh, you know, even though I am a professor of literature, I was always interested in multi arts scenes, you know, because the poets talk to the musicians, talk to the visual artists, uh, and I wanted to reflect that on all of my books of prose and poetry, all 14 of them, I have um, work by African-American artists on the cover. Uh, you know, not just book covers that are designed and that, you know, but art, actual artwork. And I line them up sometimes and look at them like a gallery um, because I think that um, taking every single moment to lift up culture um, is important um, and part of making a conversation. It's part of how my own work has gotten, you know, known is that, you know, the work of, of poets lifting up the other poets. Um, and so what I thought was kind of neat about, about this art is that sometimes it speaks very directly to the text. So the chapter on Stone Mountain has a work by the artist Kara Walker in the High Museum that faces, you know, that, that sort of is in conversation directly with Stone Mountain. But other pieces, uh, and I would choose the word inter interstitial as well, are meant to be, or maybe I use a music term, a jazz term, they're contrapuntal, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're syncopated, they're, you know, meant to be, you know, a, a, a beat, uh, a pulse, something that makes you stop, stops time, and then you go back to the words. Um, and so I hope that that makes for a very dynamic book and also one that you wouldn't just read once and that you could read different ways. You know, you, I, I'm going to, I'm going to let you read, but I want to read something right from the, because you, you had me at hello, as they say, <laughs> right from the very beginning. And I thought, you know, I want to read this, but then ask you why you started this way. The problem of the 21st century remains the mm. color line. Yes, we are mired in overlapping societal struggles and challenges, but white supremacy in its many manifestations, some of them sly and cloaked some of them clear as a Confederate flag flown by marauders in the US Capitol has been a fundamental problem for every generation in this country since black people first came to this land. W.E.B. Du Bois's, how does it feel to be a problem is still the question implicitly and explicitly directed at black people. I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of, come to terms in this book that what, and I would love to, to, to talk to you about our generation because um, I certainly hoped and imagined that the racial struggles of our great grandparents, our grandparents, our parents in our lives, that, that, that our children would not have the same color line to overcome. Uh, I've said in my own generation, like, you know, I'm just not supposed to be the first anything, <laughs> you know, I mean, like the, all the first blacks are supposed to have already, but, but still we find ourselves the, you know, right. the first in, in, in many situations, but you hope it gets better for the kids. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, are some things better for the kids? Well, yes, but the racial problem at the center of this country is squarely there. So now we have to look to their ingenuity to marry with historical understanding and what we have to offer to find a new set of solutions. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that growing up with a sense of not necessarily inexorable racial progress, but certainly moving forward. Um, uh, you know, with, you know, we talk about um, the moment, and I write about this, of um, President Obama's uh, election, and what an extraordinary moment that was, I would say, not just for Black people, but actually for uh, uh, America at large, saying, you know, we can, we can pick the smartest guy, <laughs> you know, we can pick the person who represents more than himself. We can pick the person who is, is the most decent and inspires our own decency. We can do that. We can say race won't get in the way of making that choice. So I think actually even it was easy for Black people to <laughs> choose Obama. I think for others, it meant more to them in a way. Um, but I think that, you know, one, presidential politics doesn't measure everything. And two, 
of course, what we saw after two um, terms of Obama was, um, uh, you know, the violence, the hatred, the misogyny, the racism, the aggressivity, the ignorance, uh, uh, and, um, you know, just the unraveling of the Trump years with so much that was authorized from on high. And one might say that in some ways, symbolically, you know, January 6th at the Capitol showed us that, that all of this unraveling was pulling at the thread of democracy itself, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's been quite a role in the last few years, you know, to understand that we're having to repair and reinvent things that we might have thought we could count on. Yeah. And that's very sober. You know, you, you drop a lot of context and history and hey, you're a historian, right? You, you, you layered and particularly in the first part of it. And a lot of it stopped me to, to you know, think, and I think it'll stop others to make them just reflect a little bit, but even things like maps, you know, you say maps are not neutral. <clears throat> you cite just how exaggerated the size of North America and Europe and juxtaposition to, you know, African and Latin America and just what that does to the mind, you know, and, and the perpetuation uh, of, of who's important and who's not. Um, how, you, talk about that a little bit. Well, I think that, you know, um, in a noticing um, that um, I have been doing also with my work at Mellon with the Monuments Project, I'm, 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 I'm really focusing on all of these things that we take for granted that are all around us, that something is more important if it's large and made of stone. Uh, and so we feel small in front of it. Uh, and we feel that maybe, you know, we are uh, not great in front of it. Uh, and, you know, you need to pause a minute to say, wait a minute, in the case of Stone Mountain, this large thing is enshrining white supremacy. You need to look at the things you pass by every day. You know, why is that man on a horse who lost a war up on a pedestal looming over everybody else? There's a beautiful work that I love um, following some of the great monuments work that's being done by Monuments Lab in Philadelphia. And they had, um, I, I won't recall the name of the artist who did it, but it's two empty plinths that invite people simply to get up and stand there. You know, so, you know, a little girl comes up and is large. You know, what does that instruct both to the little girl on the plinth, but also to the people who walk by and the little girl is, is large. Um, so, you know, I think, at, you know, with, with maps, I mean, we, you know, we grew up with those maps in our classrooms uh, that centered the United States. You know, why is it that in the United States, I mean, people don't know more than one language in the United States for the most part in ways that they do in other parts of the world. Why would you, I don't want to feel bigger than I am, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? I actually think there's something warping when you, you know, are, are taught that you have it all, know it all, are at the center. I think there's great power actually which I think as black people, we've had to learn and practice if you are not at the center. And so if even a map in a classroom uh, can be something that you can uh, it, it kind of give it a close read and understand it better, I think that kind of critical thinking is what I think African-American studies is all about. And so uh, now that I'm not teaching anymore, I just have to keep teaching. <laughs> Good, keep, keep teaching. I think that's, uh, we all need your teaching. You know, the Trayvon generation, just the coining of that and, and getting one's mind around that generation, you know, and, you know, the kids who've grown up um, coming of age in the last 25 years, you have two sons, uh, Simon and Solomon of that generation. I have one. Um, how do you define that generation? And then I know you want to read from part of the, that part of the book. So Maybe just start with that question and yeah. define that generation. What, what comes to mind when you think of that generation? Well, I'll go right to the reading because, you know, I always feel like, well, I, you know, yeah. I, took some, I took some time and said it better. <laughs> yeah. 
That's right. Okay. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> so this this goes on for a minute, but I think it gives you a sense of the context. This one was shot in his grandmother's yard. This one was carrying a bag of Skittles. This one was playing with a toy gun in front of a gazebo. Black girl in bright bikini, black boy holding cell phone. This one danced like a marionette as he was shot down in a Chicago intersection. The words, the names, Trayvon, Laquan, Bikini, Gazebo, Lucy, Skittles, two seconds, I can't breathe, traffic stop, dashboard cam, 16 times, his dead body lay in the street in the August heat for four hours. He was jogging, was hunted down, cornered by a pickup truck and shut, shot three times. One of the men who murdered him leaned over his dead body and was heard to say, excuse me, fucking nigger. I can't breathe again, nine minutes and 29 seconds of a knee and full weight on his neck. I can't breathe. And then mama, George Floyd cried. George Floyd cried, mama, I'm through. The kids got shot and the grownups got shot, which is to say the kids watched their peers shot down and their parents' generation get gunned down and beat down and terrorized as well. The agglomerating spectacle continues. Here are a few we know less well. Danny Ray Thomas, Johnny Germain Rush, Nania Kane, Dejuan Hall, Atatiana Jefferson, Demetrius Brian Hollins, Jacqueline Craig and her children, and then the iconic Alton Sterling, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, Brianna Taylor, Philando Castile. I call the young people who grew up in the past 25 years, the Trayvon generation. They always knew these stories. These stories formed their worldview. These stories helped instruct young African-Americans about their embodiment and their vulnerability. The stories were primers in fear and futility. The stories were the ground soil of their rage. The stories instructed them that anti-Black hatred and violence were never far. So that's what I think is the Trayvon generation. And I think we have to take stock, you know, I mean, we, witness the same things that our hearts hurt yeah. but when kids watch this as they come of age as they think who am I as a young black person in the street trying to be me trying to be free trying to walk safely um, how are they processing all of this vulnerability because yeah. the vulnerability is real you, you write that you said, I believe that this generation is more vulnerable and more traumatized than the last. I, I do. Why? Um, I think um, a part of it is technology, um, not technology per se, but the fact that, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we do know things about witnessing violence. We do know things about seeing your own um, subjectivity or, or subjects with whom you identify, uh, you know, watching them, uh, watching terrible things happen to them. I mean, if you even just think about fiction movies and the things that we might be, uncomfortable, you know, there, there are plenty of things I can't watch in a movie because it stays with me. It enters my dream space. I can't get rid of it. And so imagine these kids because, you know, their cell phones, and again, mind you, this is not anti-technology or anti-cell phone. They're watching this over and over and over and over and over and over again. How are they processing it? How are they processing it? And how are we, um, you know, so one of the works of art that I, I really love in the book is um, Elizabeth Catlett's The Torture of Mothers. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, a black woman's head and inside the head uh, is uh, a, a circle. And in that is a black young man in a pool of blood. You know, the idea that it never leaves you. So how do we teach our children? I mean, for, for me, a very signal moment, you know, Trayvon Martin is killed in 2012, 2013. George Zimmerman, the man who hunted and shot him dead is acquitted. And right about at that time, uh, Ryan Coogler's um, uh, Fruitvale Station comes out, mm -hmm. which tells the story of a day in the life of yeah. Oscar Grant, who was murdered by transit police in the Bay Area. 
an extraordinary movie, I think, by an extraordinary young Great filmmaker, movie. Yeah. you know, right? And at that time, so 2013, my kids were young. My kids were whatever they were, you know, 11, 12, something like that. And, you know, things are on the news. They know about Trayvon Martin. They know that justice was not done. Uh, and I want them to see a movie with that kind of sensitivity, which at the end of the day is about a regular guy in the day in his life. Uh, uh, you know, that, that ends tragically in part because of the body he's walking around in, but they're young. And so I feel like there's so much wrestling with, um, you know, not wanting them to be overburdened, but wanting them to be safe, wanting them to be imaginative and free, wanting them to be completely bored by the subject of race, but knowing that they can't afford not to be. You you reflect a lot as a mother of sons in this generation. I, and I, of course, you know, you know, my wife, Donna, <clears throat> we have a lot of the same conversations. So when I was reading it, a lot of it, I was listening to, I was, I was hearing the echo of a lot of the conversations we've had and how she feels. You said it was almost like she could have said the same thing and probably did. I, I believe I could keep my sons alive by loving them. And you know, that, that sense that of, of protectiveness, if I wrap my arms around them. Um, how do you struggle and wrestle with that, you know, of letting them go out into the world, the worry, the, the sense of, you know, pride of wanting to be everything they can be. And, and then the, and the, the, the whispers in the back of your mind, all of the things that you go through you, you, you said it another thing, every black mother I know is exhausted in her own way. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think that's just the truth. And I think that it is, you know, an ongoing struggle. Uh, and I find even sometimes the racial anxiety translates to other things. You know, I had, it's it, interesting. My, um, my older son had a, um, a, an injury playing basketball, serious injury. And he's, um, you know, really been very, very serious about his recovery and is now clear to start playing basketball again. Yeah. And so he's like, you know, and, and he's doing the thing he needs to do. He's trusting his body. Mm -hmm. He's going out and doing it. And my stomach clutches up and I just say like, don't say anything. Don't say anything. You know, <laughs> like this is a man. This is a young man who needs to go be free in his body. This is the thing you want for him. So I mean, I think sometimes there's a, you know, maybe that's just parenthood, but also, um, you know, because, you know, one of the things I write in the book is particularly about, you know, motherhood is like, your only job on earth is to keep this creature alive. And when you have a baby, if you don't keep the baby, like, no, there's no one, when that same child I just described, I remember the first night home from the hospital, waking up to that piercing cry in the middle of the night and being like, where's mama? <laughs> like, there's only one mama here. I, that I need to keep that creature alive. Yeah. And that's, you know, how, why should that go away? Yeah. Um, yeah, why, why should it go away? It's, but there's also, does it have a disproportionate, you know, kind of, impact and consequence, you know, on, on, on sure. and that's in living with that constantly. And I've, I've heard so many black mothers talk about that. Um, yeah. And we're not, we're not far from that black dads either. So, well, I, you know, I know, and look, you know, one of the things that I think is a really important message of the book is there's a place where I say black mothers, especially, but everyone who loves black children. And yeah. to me, that should be everyone yeah. so you know to me it, it's like it's Gwendolyn Brooks's philosophy not only in the poem the boy died in my alley that I quote but in so much of her work mm -hmm. the idea that there's no such thing as other people's children as a mindset as a mindset and uh I uh I I, I hope always for more of that I'm going to remind people now to email reservations at writers block 
presents.com. And you can get your questions in to Elizabeth. We'll, we'll go to questions in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, you know, there were some, some things I probably shouldn't laugh at because <laughs> when you look at them in the context of, of history, they were serious, but reading them in present day, you're thinking like, this is a comedy sketch. And so the thing with the scholar who wrote to the boys about, does the Negro shed tears? And a whole series of questions, you know, and you, you dissect that beautifully in, in, in the sense that really, what is it saying? Are we really human at the end of the day, right? Yeah. And, and does that still, does that mindset still exist? Are we, are we, have we, or is that a thing in the past? Well, you know, I don't think that, I mean, I think that dehumanization is a precondition for excessive violence. Yeah. So, you know, and I also think that um, if you think about the fact that we were brought to this country as property, as chattel slaves, that we were legally classified as three-fifths human beings, that entire systems of mythology were set up to justify white people's dominion and to, you know, so many myths about our bodies yeah. that we didn't, I mean, you, you know, you can now to this day, and I'm sure you, you know, we, we know, we, we understand the system. We may, we, I've experienced this. I'm sure you've experienced this. The idea that, Black people don't feel pain to the same mm -hmm. extent. I mean, a huge issue in the medical profession, yeah. under treating Black people medically, under medicating us, a, a, a kind of convergence of this mythology of our bodily, you know, imperviousness, along with our the mythology of our propensity to drug addiction. Yeah, you know, so I think that's a version of does the Negro shed tears. Um, if you look about, you look at, you know, all of the, you know, for so many, you know, um, black people in, in, in the public light for black women in the public light and the, the, the language, uh, uh, that is, uh, dehumanizing language that, you know, suggests that we just don't operate the same way as other human beings. I, I don't think we're, we're done with it. No, and it's, it's sad. I mean, it's because you, you're reading it in the context was that in the, I can't remember what, what era was that in the forties? Um, the Du Bois or the? No, the, when the, the, the scholar who wrote to Du Bois back then. It was, it was earlier in the century. Yeah. Forties yeah, and forties. So, and you're thinking like, man, that is, and, but then you think about, you stop and think there's some of the same carryover of, of that mythology that, that exists today. Um, yes. You, you kind of end you toward the end with your dad, you know, and you said you saved, saved your dad for the end. I know your dad, your dad, um, maybe many people know Cliff Alexander, and he was, you know, a confidant to, to Johnson and other, you know, civil rights uh, figures of that day and first African American Secretary of the Army. Um, speaking as a journalist coming up, you know, somebody that always helped me when I mm. needed, needed, you know, some perspective on something difficult uh, as a as a journalist, uh, really tremendous man, and 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 uh, I'm I'm glad to know him, and certainly he and your mom and Dale raised a great daughter, right? And thank and, you, uh, thank you, and, and that's tremendous. But you know, your father's advice one of one of your father's advice was always carry fuck you money. That's <laughs> and, right. And that's there, and, and what did that say to you about independence and carving your own path well i think that what it what it taught me and not that it's always so easy to practice but it taught me that the you know the dominant paradigms the dominant structures the dominant institutions are not always going to recognize you in your fullness that you know they're they weren't made for us uh so sometimes we are able to you know do tremendous things within them uh, and that's what we keep trying to do. And we keep trying to do it by bringing other people along with us. Um, but, you know, you can bang yourself 
your head against a wall if you accept that paradigm that says, you know, I mean, I can tell you we stories, you know, of being, my dad's philosophy helped me when I was in English departments who said, well, you know, Lucille Clifton, Langston Hughes, they aren't really poets. That's not really poetry. That has a simplicity to it that, you know, that's, you know, just a, a saying, it's an utterance. You know, that's not poetry. It, you know, scholars saying this to me, and I'm like, okay, my entire tradition you've just said is not a tradition so i can either argue strenuously against that and i can cry and sometimes i do or i can say you are not in my paradigm so i'm gonna build something over here mm -hmm. you know i'm going to to go somewhere where i can talk about the greatness of this mighty tradition and Maybe eventually, you know, I may have only one or two people with me now, but maybe some folks will catch up with me. Um, I think that, you know, what was beautiful about that philosophy of my dad to a daughter uh, was, you know, that the FU money was about, you can always leave. You can leave the white man's job. Yeah. You can leave the man. You know, you never have to stay in a situation that could be unsafe for you in body or in mind and spirit. Yeah. And so even if you don't exercise it, knowing that you got that dollar in your pocket, or actually it's a Benjamin, literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, just, it, 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 it's, it's a mindset. And so to me, I try to give that mindset to other people. Um, and it's I, to people who, you know, aren't African-American as well, um, because it's very, very important. You know, you, you write about, and this is, a, this is another part of the book that, that got me emotional. There's so many Black men in prison who've mm -hmm. lost so many great minds to prison, and, and, mm -hmm. and they didn't, a lot of them didn't deserve to be there. But you, yep. you talk about the experience of of Angola mm -hmm. and the, the, the founding of a Black Panther uh, chapter, the Angola Panthers, and, and then essentially getting 40, three of them getting 40 years of solitary confinement, 40 plus years of solitary confinement for uh, uh, killing a guard that was, something was not proven, there was not evidence. Mm -hmm. But you talk about Herman Wallace, yeah. And so, you know, give people a little bit about Herman Wallace. Well, yeah, I mean, so Herman, Herman Wallace was one of these gentlemen, Angola Prison, uh, you know, uh, uh, a prison that if you go today, it's on land the size of the island of Manhattan. Uh, it looks like a plantation. I mean, you go in the first rotation that folks do there is picking okra or cotton. You come into fields full of brothers and, you know, white men on horseback. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just absolutely unnerving. And to know that 90% of the people who go in there will die there. To know that is the largest population of lifers on earth. To know that many of the men go in as juveniles and never come out. When I went there to visit, I went to, and I write about this, um, a, uh, um, what was called a mindfulness group. And, uh, these men were in a circle and they had been meditating and writing and you know reading things and sharing their work. You were entitled to six weeks in that group in your entire time in Angola prison. And I thought like, what is more cool? Not to have such a group or to know that in your entire life, you can only have six weeks in that community. And the men were sharing their writing and their thoughts. And one of them said, we dress our ideas in clothes to make the abstract visible. Mm. And his language was so arresting and that idea was so arresting. And in that moment, I was a teacher. I was a teacher in a circle at great universities, listening to a brilliant student say something compelling and thinking about, you know, just there before the grace of God. And so just to finish with Herman Wallace, um, uh, what, why I write about him um, is that he engaged in a, a wonderful, rich friendship with an artist, a white woman artist named Jackie Samel. Letters, uh, phone calls over many, many years. 
And she said to him as they became close, Herman, if you could design any house in the world, what would the house look like that you would want to live in? And he, you know, just sparked to this exercise. And he was like, like this, be like that, have a pool with a black panther on the bottom, you could try to Douglas, and like here would be the bar, you know, we'd be designing the whole house. And she said, I will make it for you. She's an artist. And so she sent drawings and she made maquettes and she, you know, said, I am, I am making this house for you. And he finally was exonerated of that crime that he did not commit. 40 years in solitary confinement is positively unimaginable. And he came out of prison, he saw his family, he met Samel, and he died three days after. Yeah. And it's so she has, it's heartbreaking. And she has kept up. I mean, she made Herman's house as a sort of a traveling art exhibit. She's made other extraordinary, you know, incarceration is the space that she works in now. She's made um, amazing gardens that are in the size and dimension of a solitary cell and planted uh, things in them that, that, that grow. I mean, you know, she's a, she's a really amazing, amazing conceptual artist. Her art born out of bearing witness and to making deep human connection with these folks who were locked away yeah let's uh take some questions i know that people have out there um for uh elizabeth alexander this is uh andrea yeah i'm coming oops oh all right okay <laughs> i hear her i know okay <laughs> um we have some questions that have come in and two of them interestingly deal with technology so i'm going to read both of them and um and answer both of them or one of them whatever the first one is how does social media offer a platform for the trayvon generation that didn't exist in previous generations that's number one. And then number two from somebody else is how can we protect our young black generation from the constant barrage of technology, given that technology is more and more prevalent in our day to day life. So there's sort of so two right. kind of together. Um, well, I guess I would say um, to the second question. Um, I think, you know, look, I mean, te you know, technology is a tool and, it, you know, it can be used for good or for ill, but there's no not being able to be adept with technology and, and being able to make your way uh, in, the, in the world. You know, <laughs> even I have learned to track changes. <laughs> um, that's a joke. Um, but at any rate, you know, so I, I think that, you know, technology isn't predatory, isn't dangerous, isn't anything unto itself except a tool to be used or misused and absolutely the coin of the realm, uh, you know, today. Um, and so I think that, you know, turning to um, social media, um, I think it's been amazing to see how um, social media, not just for, for these young people, but for all of us has connected us. I mean, look at us, you know, um, how do people find out about this event? Um, if you look at the last two years of, um, of COVID, I think um, being able to be connected to each other when we couldn't be with each other, um, the young folks led the way, but that it, that's been very, 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 very important. Um, I think that, you know, as with anything with young people, you know, with our children, um, we need to know how they spend their time. Uh, we need to, you know, know, just like, you know, whose house your kids going to play at, you know, you want to also know what they're doing with their technology. And so um, I think that, you know, that just is one of the challenges of, um, of parenting, but it's an important one. I don't know, maybe Kevin, you might have more to say to that. No, I think you, you covered it. I think, I think you're exactly right. Um, for the Trayvon generation, how do issues of race, gender, and class intersect? Well, I think that, um, you know, race, gender, and class, um, uh, and other aspects of our identities are always intersecting, right? Uh, I mean, it, you know, in the kind of misnaming, the hijacking of critical race theory, 
uh, that has been such a disturbing um, aspect of the last uh, couple of years and something that I briefly touch on in the book uh, in talking about the John Hope Franklin textbook. Um, you know, I think, you know, we've, we've forgotten some of the brilliant work by I'm thinking particularly of a legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who gave us the whole idea of intersectionality to talk about how it's not like you take off one aspect of your identity and leave it to the side, you know, I, I'm never not a black woman. I'm never, you know, just one of those things. And we are, you know, we are classed, we are generation, we are regional, we are sexuality, um, you know, all of, of, of those aspects are who we are all the time. For the Trayvon generation in particular, I think they're actually just much more practiced at living in their complexity and living, you know, what I think uh, Audre Lorde challenged us to say, don't, don't let aspects of your identity be separated. You are all these many things. Um, and I really love seeing um, in a lot of the young people that I know, um, uh, they don't find that so hard at all. Uh, and I would say like, thank you, feminism. Thank you, gender studies. Thank you, African-American studies. A lot of it has stuck. This question is from me because uh, uh, I love your book. Anyway, uh, the book includes beautiful photos um, of art pieces by black painters and photographers. Last year, the portraits of Barack and Michelle Obama made the rounds. They were at LACMA uh, and you, you could barely get in. I mean, I, you were lucky to score a ticket to go and see the um, the, the portraits before they left. They were here for a pretty short time. So, uh, and you have a, a portrait in the book by Amy uh, Sherald. Amy Sherald, yeah. yeah. And when I saw it, I didn't, I didn't see her name immediately, but I said, God, that style looks really familiar. And then when I looked at her name, I said, yeah, I know she did Michelle. Okay, so my question to you is this was this resonance, this eagerness to see the Michelle and Barack Obama portraits all over the country. Um, was that due to the subject material or you know, the people who sat for the portraits or was it something else altogether that captured us? You know, the, the dress and, the, and Obama in the flowers, you know? Can you mm -hmm. talk? about that, whether it was the people or whether it was- well, That's interesting. Um, I haven't thought about that. Well, I mean, first, you know, to connect it for a minute to the book, to keep talking about Amy Sherald, the picture, um, the painting that she did is really, um, well, I don't have it called up, so if I can't find it quickly, I won't show it, but um, it's a, a beautiful painting of a black man in a cowboy, here we go. It's called here. So here's the, the picture, the painting. So um, black man, cowboy hat uh, and cowboy belt and his shirt is the American flag. And the title of the piece is what's precious inside of him does not care to be known by the mind in ways that diminish its presence, all American. And so you know, she is such a great painter and there's so much happening there. You know, the idea of wearing the flag, wearing Americanness. Uh, even if America, you know, doesn't fully love or embrace you. The unexpectedness of, okay, you know, there are Black cowboys, there are Black people who come out of that particular tradition, but it's not the John Wayne cowboy, you know, so it's sort of subverting a stereotype. And then that beautiful title, which opens up all of the mystery of what is inside. Uh, so I think one of the things about portraits is that um, they invite us, and what I loved when, when those, I, I, I saw the portraits at LACMA along with the show of Black portraiture. Right. And I think that's what was so important. You go from the iconic to all of those amazing, amazing, I mean, that was the best, you know, exhibit of Black portraiture there ever has been, yeah, um, in, 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 my, in my opinion. So you see all of these Black subjects, which forces you to say, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Black people, well, guess what? You know, Black people are, everything you can imagine. Black people are extraterrestrial. Black people are, you know, everything in the whole wide world. Um, I think that with those portraits, we saw a, a very modern era of presidentness. I think we saw 
you know, the first presidential portraits uh, where artistry itself and imagination were allowed into the frame. Uh, so, you know, President Obama, as you say, in the flowers and in very particular flowers, you know, Hawaiian flowers, Kenyan flowers, flowers, uh, you know, of, of place, um, you know, and we, we just had never seen artists allowed to fully be expressive artists, even as they were doing the portraits of these historical figures for all time. So I think, what can I say? I think that those artists just did it better and everybody, you know, wanted to see it. And that was really great. Yeah. And to my knowledge, uh, I, I mean, I could be absolutely wrong. I'm sure I'll get some emails, but I, to my knowledge, it, what, it's not so common to have the first lady get her own portrait uh, that goes on tour. <laughs> with the... Well, I don't think the portraits have ever gone on tour. I'm not, I think that the, right. the tour might, might be, might be new. Yeah. But in White House tours that I've taken, you know, over the centuries, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't recall the first ladies, but, uh, but this they, was... they have their portraits and some of them, like you might recall, if you saw the Jacqueline um, Kennedy, you would remember oh, having yeah. seen it. You know, it's kind of like yellowish. It's a beautiful painting. It's a, it's a, it's really a beautiful painting, but, um, but there's more um, freedom of imagination in, in these uh, contemporary ones. Okay, thank you for that. Here's one that came in. You mentioned that in black communities, it's common to see, uh, in your book, you say that in black communities, it's common to see people wearing t-shirts of young people whom their community mourn. Is this a cultural statement or a political statement? Is this more common in black communities than in other ethnic communities? Well, first of all, thank you, early reader. That's yeah. great. That means somebody's read it in the last two days. I appreciate that. And I describe a scene in New Haven, Connecticut, which is the city where I've actually lived the most in my, in my life, a city very dear to me, um, coming upon a funeral, um, uh, not knowing it was a funeral at first, knowing that traffic had stopped and then seeing, you know, a mass of these, you know, sort of people in goldenrod and, and, and on it, the face of a young man. Uh, who had died too soon. Um, and and I, I use that example to talk about the ways that um, even if uh, Black people are not memorialized proportionately in biographies, in monuments, in memorials, in, you know, in all of the ways that, that people are made forever, I'm very interested in our community practices, in the ways in which we still mark <clears throat> and remember and honor our dead. So there are many such examples, one of them being th that one, another one being uh, thinking particularly about the memorial to Sandra Bland by the side of the road. You know, we've, we've seen many, you, know, you see them when you're driving these roadside memorials to people mm -hmm. who've perhaps been, you know, killed by a drunk driver. Um, but the one to Sandra Bland, uh, you know, marking uh, uh, the violence with which she was stopped by the police uh, and the sequence of events that ultimately led to her death, um, I think are examples of a way, uh, and I think even Black poetry uh, is a way that we um, insist on remembering, even when we know that uh, uh, official spaces may not remember us well. This question is for both of you. Um, how can the Trayvon generation deal with whites with the white supremacy that is fueling voter suppression and police brutality against young black people? I'd like to start by just saying, you know, something that I say in the book that's really, really important is black people did not create white supremacy. And I really turn this back to white people. I don't know, you know, what the what the what the race of, of the questioner is, but mm -hmm. um, I uh, but I, I, I feel you, you know it's an opportunity for me to say um, let's remember who has the power to dismantle this system. You know, you made it, you take it apart. Um, and I think that a larger point, I don't mean that flippantly, is that um, society in general has to embrace the persistence of the color line as uh, a, uh, an impediment to our 
uh, our, our community flourishing for everybody. Kevin, do you have anything on that? I'll say what, what Elizabeth said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think she's right. I mean, I, yeah. I, it's, it's often, and that's part of the, the burden of, of being black and Elizabeth deals with that in different places. It, it's like in, in, that, in the opening question that the boys asked is what does it feel like to be a problem? You know, it's, it's like, it's not really, everybody wants to know what the burden is on, on us, right? And on this generation to handle the, this is the condition that exists in the country that they didn't create this generation. And so, you know, it's, it's admirable what this generation is doing. It's, it's the, it's as, it's as bright and as smart and as effervescent as alive and as any generation, you know, I say that about my field. I'm constantly telling people when they talk about journalism and the decline of this and that, this is, this generation of journalists is as good as any generation that I've seen, mm. you know? Um, and so they have a lot going for them and precisely because they grew up in this time. Some of it is really bad and difficult, but, but they also grew up amidst the technological revolution and mm. they're entrepreneurs like crazy. You know, they're, they invent stuff. They, they have a lot of instinct and, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a great generation. And one of the things that, you know, just to bring it back to some joy, one of the things I loved was Elizabeth talking about her son's dancing, you know, mm -hmm. the auntie's over there looking at him and say, These <laughs> kids dance, you know, and amidst all of the things they're dancing and they're expressing themselves. That expression is, is really infectious. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end with joy because, because this book has a great deal of it, especially, uh, well, all over the place. Go to the, our website uh, and you'll find a link to SO1 Books. Uh, they have signed book plates and this book is really terrific. I urge you to read it to broaden your perspective and to enhance your understanding. Uh, so thank you so much to Kevin and to Elizabeth. I, I really look forward to seeing both of you soon. It's a tremendous book. I want to, I want to add my stamp to that. It's, it's, you know, and, and Elizabeth is just, the kids will say just dropping straight gems throughout, you know, it's, it's, it's lines and, you know, I'll just say this last one here. None of us shall live forever but art and knowledge and wisdom can. Mm. That sounded good. Thank Elizabeth you. Alexander. Yeah. Thank you so much for this beautiful conversation, Kevin. And thank you, Andrea, for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Bye.